Hello, and welcome to SoberCast, where we provide AA speaker meetings and workshops in podcast format. We're an ad-free podcast, and if you enjoy listening, please help us be self-supporting by visiting SoberCast.com, look for the donate link, and drop a dollar or two into our virtual basket. We hope you enjoy the podcast. Have a great day. Thank you. My name is Tim. How long have I got? Oh, yeah, and after three or four hours, you're going to speak for an hour, and then we'll have ten minutes for questions. Marvelous. Thank you for having me. Uh, someone is interpreting, I, I am told, so I shall speak slowly and loudly. <laughs> loudly, okay. Um, I was very impressed in the first session of the quality of the program here and uh, rather like someone shared in the first session I felt rather embarrassed to share I was thinking mostly about not not having sugar one hour at a time I think you've all got a far better program than I have but anyway I'm sitting here this evening um, and I have a very odd history with recovery Um, I I wish I had a neat and tidy Alamon story, but I don't. I have an Alamon story which is mixed up with my story of uh, recovery in other fellowships. And if you take four or five different coloured pots of paint and pour them into one pot, you cannot then separate them. You can't get the original paints back. So I don't know where, whatever I say, I don't know where it came from, who it came from, which, I know sometimes which book it was found in, but not always. So if anything I say helps you, wonderful. And if it doesn't, well, there's not a lot I can do about that. I shall do my best to share the parts of my story which are relevant, um, and I'm going to focus on my Alanon experience and issues and solutions I've found in all sorts of different places. On the subject of finding solutions in different places, uh, there was an episode of the American comedy series Friends where uh, one of the characters was teaching another of the characters to sail. Uh, the Jennifer Aniston character, I hope this isn't breaking her anonymity, she was teaching Joey how to sail, and Joey had no experience of sailing and was terrible, and she was shouting at him. And he said, why? Stop shouting at me, I can't stand this. And she said, I'm not shouting at you, I'm shouting near you. (laughs) So my Alanon, and that's an Alanon tool. It's not, it, it's, it's not one of the slogans, but it's as good as for me. Uh, not everything is about me. The angry person was angry before I walked in the room and will be angry after I leave the room. Therefore, I didn't make them angry. I may have occasioned the anger, but I didn't cause the anger. They were angry already. So it's not about me. Um, why do I even need to go to Alanon? Um, again, I wish I had a neat and tidy story of how I qualify for Alanon, but I don't. There are lots of different reasons why I needed to come to Alanon, and why, when I did come to Alanon, I identified more intensely, actually than in any other 12-step fellowship I've been to or belonged to. Um, Because alcoholism and the response of the family to alcoholism was the environment I grew up in, and I had no idea. Because it was just the air you're breathing. It wasn't an object. You can only see an object if it is somewhere over there. If it is your entire universe, you can't see it. If you asked a fish, it probably wouldn't know what water was because it is simply the medium it lives in. And I grew up in a household with a brother, a much older brother, who was gone by the time I knew 
uh, what was going on. He was out of the house. He was living somewhere else. And he was an alcoholic. And he was allowed to visit occasionally. And when he was allowed to visit, I wasn't allowed to see him. I, I saw him through windows, but I wasn't allowed. I interacted for minutes, but I wasn't allowed to get to know him. And we received a phone call one day from a police officer from another part of the country with an accent I didn't recognize to say that my brother had committed suicide as an alcoholic who I discovered decades later had been in AA and had left AA and had started drinking again and had committed suicide. Except in my family, we didn't use the word alcoholic. We didn't use the word suicide. But you know, because you've seen the person with the bottle of whiskey and the cigarettes, uh, you see things in dreams that you shouldn't know. And you know what the truth is, and you know you've been lied to. So I grew up in a family deeply affected by alcoholism that would not use the word alcoholic. We had a different word, lazy people. My family had lazy people. And in my family, my mother, bless her, she's 89, she diagnoses every new person in the family, anyone who marries into the family or anyone who grows up in the family as a lazy person or one of the competent people whose job it is to clear up after them and to stop them from destroying themselves. And I haven't even got to the crazy bit. <laughs> the competent people in my family who are very organized and very efficient and very effective and scan the horizon for danger marry lazy people <laughs> that's the crazy bit uh, my father God rest his soul was not an alcoholic but he was gone a lot, doing things which cost a lot of money, and we don't know what those things even were. But the sense in my family was that there are people in the family who make the family leak. They leak the money, they leak the security, they leak, they leak everything, and our job is to stop them from leaking. And the way you stop them from leaking is by shouting at them. And if you shout long enough and hard enough and use all of the other techniques of manipulation, the silence, the g you know the game where you're silent and they have to guess why you're silent because if they loved you they would guess accurately and so they because they don't guess it means they don't love you so you're now even more silent than you were before this is this was thought of as one of the family tools when I was 11 I said to my mother I was depressed and she said we are all depressed. <laughs> it gets worse. She added, but you'll grow up, you'll have children, and they will be your life. So now I knew that I had a responsibility towards her to be the reason that she was on the planet. And I wanted to die at this point as a brother. I wanted to follow as swiftly in the footsteps of my brother as I could. Uh, but he had used up the family voucher for suicide. And so I couldn't because the fewer there are left, the more responsibility on the remaining children to fix the broken adults. And I have had 
six brothers and sisters of various descriptions. Three brothers are dead. Two of the sisters are mentally ill. The third uh, sister is nuts. <laughs> um, so there was a lot of pressure. And when my brother committed suicide, uh, uh, it was actually said overtly, if you do well at school, it will take your family's pain away. This wasn't even a covert message. <laughs> this was, it was a banner over the door. And the sense was, it's a, it was a, a family in which there were some achievers. And the sense was, if you, if you had ever achieved, you had to continue achieving. Or guess what? It means you're one of the lazy people. And so I was terrified growing up. What am I? Am I one of the competent people who rushes around doing things, or am I one of the lazy people? And it turned out I was one of the lazy people. Um, so I had uh, a short few years of catastrophic addiction. Mostly alcohol. But, um, my alcoholism was very closely tied up with other aspects of my alanonism. Mm -hmm. I've talked about the drunks and the leakers in my family. The other thing about the leakers, my father was one of the leakers, the, one of the lazy people, one of the addicts of some description or other. Um, he was gone a lot. But when he was there, he was also gone a lot. He wasn't present. No attention. His attention was not on us. Uh, I'm not blaming him. I'm simply describing the experience we had. And so the yearning is to find a way to connect with the people who are absent. And I've spent my whole life chasing after people who <coughs> run away from everyone and running away from the people that want to connect with me and then wondering why I'm lonely. <laughs> um, so that those distant, dreamy people to me were very attractive. And I found alcoholics, uh, as an adult, I formed relationships with people that were emotionally shut down and distant and usually had a tiny little bit of a problem with alcohol or drugs hardly worth mentioning. Mm -hmm. But everything was taped down. And the other thing about those people who dealt with their emotions with alcohol and drugs was that they could contain themselves, the ones I chose. I know there are different types of alcoholics and addicts. Um, the thing that I was terrified of was uh, uh, that there was a lot of shouting when I grew up uh, from my mother. Um, and there was a lot of worrying. Um, two very important mechanisms in the condition of alanonism. Um, my parents ran a guest house. They were retired and ran out of money because of my father. So my mother started a guest house. She turned the house into a guest house. And each year, because of changes in tourist patterns, we were having fewer and fewer guests. And she would sit at one of the windows overlooking the road, counting the number of cars driving past per hour and doing graphs and predicting the downfall of the family. <laughs> and this constant worry and con uh, worry as a means of controlling, if you worry it's because you care and if you don't worry it's because you don't care. So if you try to get away from the worry she would follow you into another room with the worry, so you've left your worry behind, let me bring it to you. <laughs> because if you didn't worry, you were clearly one of the irresponsible people. 
So this is a little bit of a picture of the family I grew up in. Um, the other thing about the shouters, when you grow up in an environment with people who have gone a lot, and even when they're there, they've gone a lot because they're passed out or whatever, and there are people who are shouting, at least the ones who are shouting notice you're there. And it took me years to see this. There is an emotional payoff for me in being in relationships with people that have a lot of negative emotion about me because at least they have some emotion about me. And so I've spent my life strangely not running away from people from whom others would run away in an instant. And there are various personality types uh, in, in, in Al-Anon, I'm sure you've noticed. And, and I can be all of them on the same day. Um, the four personality types, the, 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 the first one is, is the doormat. And I started to become a doormat with shouters and angry people. So I would put up with stuff, thinking it was completely reasonable, not knowing I was allowed to leave the room, or stop the conversation, or find someone to make the shouting stop. I would take it, and take it, and take it. As I say, because there was an odd payoff there. And similarly, with relationships with alcoholics, I've had a lot of relationships <laughs> with alcoholics. Um, and the two main types, actually three main types of relationship with alcoholics, there were intimate relationships with alcoholics. This is as an adult, intimate relationships with alcoholics. I have sponsored several hundred of them in AA over the... I've been... So, for what it's worth, I've been sober in AA for... Uh, coming up for 25 years. Uh, my first Al-Anon meeting was around 24 years ago. And there are some other fellowships too. 46 now to save you doing maths late on Thursday evening in Jerusalem. Um, the doormat. I would be a doormat with alcoholics I was in a relationship with. I would let them get away with stuff because there is a there is a particular form of intimacy that I found with alcoholics that I couldn't find with other people. And it's very difficult to describe and not everyone in Alabama has experienced this. When I've shared this before, some people totally get it, others are completely blank. So if this that you don't relate to, then uh, don't worry. You're not the only one. You can still stay in the room. Um, <laughs> but I found it the other day uh, in the book Discovering Choices, um, which is one of the Alanon books that I love very greatly. Um, it's about a man who's in a relationship with a woman who is an alcoholic. And he says, one day, she was a sober alcoholic that starts drinking again. Then one day, she has some drinks at a business meeting, and our evening plans changed. She got drunk, which I enjoyed, since she was far more physically affectionate to me than she had been previously. I enjoyed the affection, such as it was, but it got me wondering about how much she actually liked me or whether it was just alcoholic behavior that had nothing to do with me. And I would experience alcoholics when drunk, being capable of an intimacy they were not capable of sober and so unbounded I could connect. Whereas healthy people, there were so many layers of boundary and learning to get to know them. Who has the time for that? <laughs> I needed to go straight to the result. 
and with an alcoholic I could get it. Except I've been on the other side of that equation and I know what's going on. Um, my friend Tom, who's been sober since 1976, he says, and in Al-Anon since 1978, talks about alcoholics and addicts. Uh, the the a- alcoholic addict bit of the brain being shared with lower animals, with mammals and with the, uh, with other mammals and with reptiles. And the example he gives is your your pet lizard does not love you. It knows you are the source of flies and heat. These are the two things it needs. Whilst you supply the flies and the heat, it will appear to love you, but it loves the commodity, not you. And as an alcoholic, I used the commodity that other people provided me, whether it was love or attention or respect or validation or money or support. And I never saw the person, I only saw the commodity. And as an Alanon, I would be on the other side of that and just not understand why when they were sober, they were not there again. Where is this person gone? It was a complete mystery to me. I just didn't understand it. Um, and if I can share some lyrics from a song which is not conference-approved literature. So if you only want to hear conference-approved quotations, get some of the cheese from the table over there and put it in your ears for about a minute or so, then you'll be safe. Um, um, and, and this sums up my al experience with rela- intimate relationships with alcoholics. The sun comes up, I think about you. The coffee cup, I think about you. I want you so, it's like I'm losing my mind. Um, All afternoon, doing every little chore, the thought of you stays bright. So, this was the curious thing. I would be in catastrophic relationships with relapsing or still drinking alcoholics, and yet the thought of them and what things would be like when they finally got sober, that was the thought that stayed bright. When I have helped them become the person they could be, so there was an awful lot of... The great thing about fixing other people is you appear to have the power and you don't need to deal with your own stuff and other people's problems seem so much simpler and more obvious to solve than your own. And as a friend of mine in al says, the less I know about you, the clearer I am about what you need to do. <laughs> the more I know, the less I have to say. Um, this wonderful line, spend sleepless nights to think about you. The temptation to continue thinking about the alcoholic, two o'clock in the morning, three o'clock in the morning. It's not, it's not that the thoughts are keeping me awake. I stay awake to continue the mental obsession with the alcoholic. And this doesn't just apply in intimate relationships. There are all sorts of relationships with alcoholics, which are not intimate, where the sponsees, people I'm doing service with in recovery, <clears throat> where I'll get a text at 11 o'clock at night, and I immediately reply, and then there's no response, and 2 o'clock in the morning, I'm still thinking about it. Spend sleepless nights to think about you. And this is the key line about trying to have a relationship with someone who is in active addiction and looking for genuine connection. You said you loved me, or were you just being kind, or am I losing my mind? And I have found relationships, intimate relationships with alcoholics, drove me crazy because I was—I never knew who was going to walk in through the door. 
terrifying and disorientating and not knowing, am I mad? Are they mad? Is my response normal? What is going on here? Having no way of navigating those situations. Um, much more recently, um, I haven't had a close relationship with a drinking or relapsing alcoholic for a very long time now. One day at a time. Um, but there are other types of relationship. If you're in the world of recovery, you're going to come across a lot of addicts and alcoholics. And, of course, part of the program is to try and help people. Uh, now, so far, so good. The solution in some fellowships is, in fact, to try and help people. But I've got a tiny little problem with help. Um, and it's this, my friend Annie um, from Marin County says, help is the sunny side of control. Don't get your help all over people. <laughs> <laughs> like it's some kind of substance that you're spilling on them. And one of the things that makes Al-Anon a more sophisticated program for me is that the same behavior in two different relationships can be healthy in one relationship and deeply pathological in another. So I will get a sponsee phone call and I spend a lot of time sponsoring and I couldn't do it if I didn't have the al program to help me, the al principles. I can have a phone call where someone explains the situation and asks for help, and I set out three helpful solutions, and it's the right thing to do, and it's the healthy thing to do. And another call can come in ten minutes later, and my contribution can be word for word the same, except there's something wrong here. And where there is something wrong, there are lots of different dynamics that you get with other people in recovery, but one of them, and this is something where I've played the game on both sides, and by game, I don't mean something that people are doing on purpose to be, to mess around. It's that what's going on on the surface is not what is going on deep inside the relationship. Um, I've tried to help people in the past where I realize I've told them the same thing 17 times. And they phone up the orphan with the broken wing and the big eyes saying, help me. I need help. And I hear the sound of, of the, the, you know, those Western films with the cowboys and the Indians and the cavalry come over the hill to save the day at the last minute. And I hear the sound of the cavalry and I am the cavalry. You're cold, I'm a sweater. And this is not helping. If someone is repeatedly coming back, they're not after help, they're after something else. And I know when this is going on, because afterwards, you feel had. And by that I mean, there's a, almost a moment when they say, gotcha. When you realize that you, you've spent 45 minutes on the phone carefully explaining something you've explained a hundred times before and you feel used, and you can't work out why, because the same words with a different sponsee on a different occasion would have been water on parched land. And the test is, over time, is the help actually being acted on, or are people coming for something else? Are people coming for relief, not recovery? Um, one of the other... One of the other things I've had to learn as well, um, 
It's incredibly difficult. This is a very difficult situation. I'm, I uh, sometimes chair committees. Uh, many years ago, I chaired a committee um, where lots of people were getting angry. And I was running past my sponsor what was going on. And we decided that what I was saying was appropriate. I was chairing the committee appropriately. But what would happen is, you know, when someone shouts at you, and immediately your brain starts responding, and then your mouth starts responding, and there has been no decision-making process. Do I even need to be in this conversation? Is it even appropriate to be in this conversation? And I've had so many conversations with people in recovery, and people outside recovery as well, where information appears to be being exchanged, but it's really one person vomiting out the emotions onto another. And I'm now able to stop and say, I'm not going to have this conversation now. I may be ready to have this conversation tomorrow, but I do not have to engage if someone is angry. And the image a friend of mine gave for this is you see that when you have a discussion with someone that's angry when I have a discussion with someone that's angry I tend to get angry myself <laughs> because I want the other person to see things the way I want them to see things and so I now have an investment and you try and be rational and you try and be logical but as a friend of mine says, it's like playing chess with a pigeon. <laughs> it doesn't know any of the rules. It struts around the board. It knocks the pieces over and then acts like it won. <laughs> and again... Angry conversations in service in AA and in Al-Anon and in other fellowships appear to be, they appear to have as their content, um, you know, the organization of the tea and coffee rotor. But they're not. They're about something else entirely. It's one of those gotcha games. And when I'm in my right mind, I don't play. Um, and the thing about these games is that when one person stops playing, the game is over. <laughs> um, um, my poor old mother was very angry for very many years for reasons I understand and honestly are good reasons. But lots of that will get projected onto me. And I tried responding angrily. I tried responding rationally. And just on the rational point, um, sometimes, as a friend of mine says, I, I'm educated beyond my intelligence level, which means that I, sometimes I need very, very simple things pointed out. And um, this is, uh, uh, it's on a section called Tools for Detachment in the book Making Crises Work for You. And uh, this is one of my favorite uh, lines. Uh, Accept the fact that you will not get healthy behavior from a sick person or logical statements from an illogical person. And I've spent years trying to talk logic and reason into people. And apart from the fact there's a little more to life than logic and reason, I've finally learned, uh, I, I can't control that any more than I can the use of alcohol or other substances. And uh, my poor old mother would uh, shout, and I and my other half would go down to stay with her for a few days. My other half would go to the supermarket to buy the bribes 
the chocolates, the fizzy wine, the other, the flowers. I mean, they were gifts. They were, but she did. They did help. <laughs> Let's be frank. And when my other half was gone, my mother would use that opportunity to let rip at me. And I discovered it was extraordinary. For years, I did not know how to respond. Shouting didn't work. Being logical didn't work. Being rational didn't work. Being practical didn't work. Being silent was the worst of all. Something had to change in me. That was the surprise. I had no I I had no idea the problem was not how I was behaving. The problem was that there was something broken in me. And this is what this is all about. So I've talked a lot about them and how that affects me. But the problem lay in me. And I discovered with my own mother that that game is only possible if the software is installed for the game inside me. It's a two-player game. Without someone else with the software installed, the game cannot be played. I needed to de-install that software. And I'm going to talk about how I reached a position of peace with my own mother. And that process I replicated across all of my other relationships. Uh, just to spoil the outcome, I have a lovely relationship with my mother now. We speak every day. There was a year when we spoke only once. So this is a difference. This has worked. But something needed to change inside me. The software needed to be deinstalled. And the truth was, there was underlying <coughs> resentment against her. That I understood rationally, but I hadn't let go of. Um, and I found solutions, practical solutions in all sorts of places. But the fundamental solution that I found to my internal problem has actually come for me through the big book of uh, Alcoholics Anonymous. Uh, it took me a long time within AA to even start using the big book as an effective tool. Um, Can I just ask for a show of hands, how many of you have read the big book? Most of you, marvellous. Has anyone done a resentment inventory, a step four resentment inventory using the big book? A lot of you. If you haven't, I highly recommend it. Uh, what is amazing, it was written in 1939. But the understanding in AA, in al in other fellowships of what was written in 1939 has grown a lot since then. And it is extraordinary to me that the same instructions can be followed now with greater depth than I think they even could be at the time. Um, I spent a lot of my life thinking that whenever there was an emotional reaction on my part to something, it was because you did X, Y, and Z, so I felt A, B, and C. I did not realize that I was the one who was producing my A, B, and C by interpreting the X, Y, and Z. And what I've done in the Step 4 Resentment Inventory is learned to take full responsibility. And sometimes people say, well, I don't know where I stop 
and the next person ends. And I understand that sentiment because action reaction seems so instant. It feels like you are, you know, when they come in through the door and you know they've had a bad day and you can't relax until you found out what the bad day was and fixed it and get confirmation that they're now okay and then oh we can all relax now it feels like everything is all enmeshed um again for my over educated mind uh i need a, a very basic thing to be pointed out you individually collectively are responsible for your actions, your thoughts, your beliefs, your values, your emotions, and your internal world. I am responsible for my actions, my thoughts, my feelings, my values, my beliefs, and my internal world. End of story. So when I'm upset, my question, I need to know what you have done, but that has not caused my emotion. My emotion has been caused by my interpretation of what you have done. And I think of my mind as being like a huge corporation with lots of departments which do not work well with each other. And I have a department um, called the Risk Management and Planning <laughs> Department. It has an overall blueprint for the entire universe. <laughs> it knows specifically what everything should look like, how everyone should behave, how everyone should vote, where borders should lie. Very clear on borders. Very clear on all sorts of things. Whose money is really whose money? And one of the sub-departments is a sort of surveillance department. It is constantly examining everybody else's behavior to determine whether or not it matches the script. And I've chased lots of things in my life. But on the, if this were an AA talk, I might talk about money and sex and power and prestige and all of the, th the obvious things the ego goes for. On the Al-Anon side, um, I want comfort. And what does comfort mean? Comfort means safety. What does safety mean? I had this idea when I was growing up that if you were perfect, they couldn't get you. If you were perfect, if you outperformed everyone, you could keep the world at bay. So you needed to be perfect to keep yourself safe. And so this little department in my mind in permanent overdrive about making sure that I am demonstrating to you my perfection or else the whole structure will crumble. If I can't look after me, who will look after me? That incredibly important idea of safety. Where am I going to find it? And I spent years trying to find it by Several means. Being perfect myself. Getting rid of your imperfections so they didn't leak onto me. Um, part of my mind will see other people as untidy rooms that need to be tidied. And once all of the rooms are tidy, I can go to bed. Completely nuts. So my negative emotion has always come not from the events that happen out there, but from my comparison of those events to my blueprint, there is always a judgment. It goes event, comparison, judgment, rage. <laughs> or fear or rage, they're the same thing, but you lift up fear, there's rage underneath, you lift up rage, there's fear underneath. And if I was ever going to be comfortable with my mother, I needed to, I needed to 
lose the judgment. How could I lose the judgment? Uh, I blamed her for the way I was. If I hadn't had this childhood, you know the story. But the worst thing, the thing that I could not easily get rid of was seeing my mother as an unhappy woman then in her late 70s. This was around 10 years ago, this big change happened with my mother. Thinking she's lost a number of children, she's now lost two husbands. Um, she's isolated, she is reclusive. She, she's not British, uh, she was from a, a European country and some difficult things happened in my family during the war which she never got over. Thinking she is never going to be fixed. She is never going to be well. And I cannot bear the sadness of seeing a life gradually dwindle without ever having shone. And my blueprint for the universe is basically this. Everyone has to be okay all the time or I can't go to bed. And so I developed a couple of other, I talked about the doormat character. I had a couple of other characters. One of those is the bulldozer. So implementing my plan, I don't care who is in the way, this is how it's going to be done. The controller. And this is where I go around fixing other people's lives so that I can give myself the illusion that problems can be fixed by human intelligence, because that gives me comfort I can fix my own. And finally, the victim, where everything that happens around me seems to affect me with a higher volume than anyone else. And my, how I'm affected by other people is dependent on the demands I have of them. When I stop demanding that my mother be happy and said, I'm not sure if this is even official as an al slogan, but I've heard it so much, who cares? Let it break around you. Let it break around you. I was trying to stop, I've spent a lot of my life trying to stop things from breaking around me. Things which are meant to break. That's a lot about the problem. What was the solution for me? There's a wonderful line in the big book where this is the forward to the... Oh, one thing on my mother. When I stopped judging her for being unhappy, because that's what it was, I was judging her for being unhappy, and thought, I don't, I wouldn't choose for her to be unhappy, but I'm going to withdraw. It's not, I'm going to continue judging it, but accept it. That's not real forgiveness. It's not real forgiveness to maintain the judgment, but to wrap it in gold paper of fake forgiveness. The job is to remove my judgment so it becomes neutral. So I saw her unhappiness as a neutral thing. That is, I mean, I'm not angry at you, I'm angry near you. She wasn't unhappy at me, she was unhappy near me. I could relax in myself. And my mother would, would for years, would still try to bait me with, you know, those particular topics that they know that if they bring the topic up, they can raise your emotion instantly. She would try and try. And I remember one conversation, I was on my phone to her. She was criticizing me for something. I can't remember what. I was doing something radically wrong. I don't, don't remember the detail. And she was saying, what do you have to say about that? And I just said, I don't, I don't know. I really don't know. 
and she carried on with her evidence that, that the, she should have been a lawyer, that, that the prosecution <laughs> the prosecution continued its case, and she kept checking. So, what are you going to say? She wanted to play the game. And finally she said, you're not going to respond, are you? And I said, no. And she did the most extraordinary thing. She laughed. She hasn't tried it again. The change needed to happen deep down inside me. And then it started to change in her. Um, where the solution comes from, I was reading this with a sponsee just this afternoon. Um, forward to the first edition, we of Alcoholics Anonymous are more than 100 men and women who have recovered from a seemingly hopeless state of mind and body. Um, mind comes first out of those two. Um, later on in the same paragraph, it says many do not comprehend that the alcoholic is a very sick person. And I can diagnose my degree of spiritual sickness at any given moment by asking myself, am I at peace? Or is there chattering going on? Are there stories being told? And to take you to the end, when I now look back at my childhood, I was hurt not by any of the things that happened, but by the story I told myself about those things. Now, I'm not blaming myself for that, for those stories, because I was taught by people how to tell stories about things that happened. I just copied their method. So this is not about blaming people, but it's about taking responsibility. People say you cannot change the past, but the past, when I sit here, is a story about what happened. And so the past can be changed. And my whole step four, resentment inventory, is all about how I thought that I was something more than a spirit temporarily trapped in a communication device called a body. My ego full of plans for sex and money and power and prestige and comfort and thrills and appearance. All of those things beyond me, which I thought were me. And the truth was, the spirit in me has always been safe. But while I thought I was something else, uh, um, there was an advert or an advertisement on the television in Britain many years ago for someone who had some sort of sore on her lip. And part of the advert, and, and the cream would take away the sore on your lip. And you would see her with this motorcycle helmet on, cycling and at the swimming pool and at the gym and at the office because she was so ashamed at having this tiny thing wrong with her lip that she had to wear the motorcycle helmet. And um, this is what I've learned as I, being identified with my body. When I look at my body and, and feel ashamed about anything of it, it's because I, I've mistaken myself for a piece of physical matter. And it's the same when I'm identified with my job. Someone criticizes my work. I'm not the piece of work I've done. I'm not even any intellectual ability or expertise. Those are just tools I've been using. I'm not the, the instrument. I'm the person using the instrument. I'm not those things. I'm not the country. I'm not my strange mixed up history of nationalities. I'm not, those are not me. That's where things have been, but it's not me. And I now know that my mother is safe. 
even on days she can't see it. I know that the person she really is, is safe, which is why it's not broken. There is nothing even broken. There is a journey happening there. There are some experiences happening there. My sponsor is, he won't call himself a mystic, but everyone calls him a mystic, whatever being a mystic means. And he says, you chose this particular visit to the planet because there must have been some lesson you wanted to learn. Now, I'm not a theologian, so I'm not going to comment on whether that accords with any traditional teaching. (laughs) But it makes sense to me. I've spent a lot of my life in recovery trying to stop other people from having whatever journey on the planet they're supposed to have, thinking that there is something wrong with human emotion. If anyone is feeling anything, there is a problem right now which we need to solve. We need to be happy, happy, happy. (laughs) Uh, And I've learned it's fine for me to have a full range of human emotions And it's fine for the person I'm with, the people I'm with, to have a full range of human emotions. A friend of mine went on a course with um, a, a spiritual teacher and psychologist who said during the course, we're going to be bringing up some very difficult material and I need you not to be hugging each other. I need you not to do that so you can actually feel something without other people trying to take it away or distract you with physical affection. And it was fascinating because uh, I was brought up to, it's the Western mentality of don't have anything wrong with you. If you have something wrong with you, get over it quickly. If you can't get over it quickly, keep your mouth shut about it. If you have something wrong with you, if you can't get over it quickly, if you refuse to keep your mouth shut about it, please go and do it somewhere else. And if you insist on staying, have the grace to look ashamed. And Alanon, for me, has been the antidote to that. Going to meetings where people at the beginning, they go around the room saying, how how do you feel today? And someone saying, today I'm depressed and anxious and upset and angry. And then 19 other descriptive words. And then everyone says, thank you. (laughs) Which I think is wonderful. Um, to forgive people in step four I needed to drop all of my judgments and to drop my judgments I needed to drop my analyses to drop my analyses I needed to drop my perceptions of what was going on our old ideas it tells me on page 58 uh, need to be let go of why? because they avail us nothing our efforts avail us nothing if we don't let go of the old ideas. And the image someone gave to me was if you have um, a bunch of balloons attached to the ground with a hundred pieces of string and you cut 99, but there's one left, the balloons will still remain attached to the ground. It's the hundredth balloon. It's the hundredth piece of string which releases all of the balloons. And so in my step four, I don't just get people to write and read out. I get them to say the prayers on the top of page 67. Um, God save me from being angry because I am the one who is in trouble. This is a sick person, i.e. this is a person who is today maybe cut off from the higher power. How can I be helpful? Footnote, keep your mouth shut. (laughs) Mind your own business. 
thy will be done. And to withdraw all of the judgments by withdrawing my allegiance to my perception of reality. Because my perception of reality is not what is actually going on. It's the film I'm projecting against the blank wall of reality. Reality is just a great big white wall which I'm telling a story about. And that's why it's legitimate to withdraw the story. I withdrew the story about you and I started to see real live people there. But that wasn't all. Two more things and then I'm going to um, wind down. Um, I needed to make amends to every, uh, to everyone for everything. To leave no stone unturned. No ill, however small, unamended. There, were, there was a 20 franc note I stole in 1981 and I needed to do something in my step nine about that 20 franc note that I stole. I couldn't even remember if I had returned it at the time because I felt guilty at the time. But I needed to do something about that. When I still had one amend left, one amend, one harm, where I had not done my utmost to straighten out the past, I still felt like I had before a lot better, a lot happier, a lot calmer, but fundamentally the same. I made the last amend. I went for a run. I said to my higher power, if there is anyone I've missed, show me. I came back from the run, no names. And all the lights went on. And I realized I'd been spending my whole life in a form of darkness that I couldn't even see because it was the fabric of my world. And for the first time in my life, everybody around me, I went to an AA meeting and I realized I was in a room of human beings and I was amazed because I had not realized what human beings were. I was, there's an Emmett Fox story about a girl who's watering a garden with a garden hose and there's no water coming out and she needed to take her foot off the hose for the water to come out. My foot was on the hose the whole time through two things judgment and unamended harms, unfinished business. And then the business of the real business of living started. And my life is very simple today. I get up in the morning, I say to my higher power, what would you like me to do today? Occasionally there's forward planning, but not a lot. And the things that I do today fall under three headings. Heading number one, I need to do things that look after my life. Otherwise, I can't be any good to anyone. I would love to quote an AA member from Glasgow on this point, but I'm not allowed to swear, and it loses its impact. Oh no, you really don't want the Glaswegian version. Um, the, 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 the state version is you're of no good to anyone if you're in a terrible state yourself. Um, put your own oxygen mask on before helping the child or insane adult next to you. <laughs> Second thing that I'm doing during the day, fulfill my obligations. I don't have a purpose in my life. God is in charge of my purpose. I have tasks delegated by my higher power. Sometimes it will be go to work. Sometimes it will be work when I'm at work. <laughs> Sometimes it will be cook the dinner for my other half. Sometimes it will be go and visit my mother. Sometimes it will be answer the phone to my sponsees. Sometimes I'll get an email from someone I've never met before in Israel saying, can you do a Skype chat? And I say to my higher power, Skype? Really? And my higher power says, check your bank account. So I checked my bank account and said, shall I come? So I did. I didn't judge this. I just asked and did what I was told. I, I, 
I don't need to look after what you think about me, what I think about me, how you treat me, what I want, what I need, or my money. God is there for that. I need to take care of the tasks that God delegates to me today, and the task that I've just been delegated is to shut up. So I'm going to stop the formal part of this right now. Thank you for listening. Thanks for listening. I hope you enjoyed the podcast. Sobercast is ad-free, and we'd like your help in order to keep it that way. So if you'd like to help us be self-supporting by pledging a dollar to a month, visit Sobercast.com and look for the donate links. Thank you very much.